Armed terrorists seize a passenger jet. On board, 80 Israelis and 100... Israel gambles all on a desperate rescue mission. If we shall fail, nobody will forgive us. Using eyewitness accounts and classified intelligence reports. This is the story of how a band of commandos took on a foreign army. Grenades, bombs, smells, shouting, shooting, hands. Follow every twist and turn as Israeli special forces face situation critical. Europe, Greece, Athens. Air France Flight 139 to Paris makes a scheduled stop in Athens to pick up 58 additional passengers. Four of them travel on fake passports. They have no intention of going to Paris. They're working for the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, a radical terror group. The PFLP is one of several anti-Israeli factions set up to regain land lost to the Jewish state during the Six-Day War of 1967. Their preferred tactic is hijacking passenger jets. Pro-Palestinian groups have seized more than 50 aircraft over the past decade. This time, they target Athens airport because staff members are on strike. They are counting on security being lax. The gamble pays off. The terrorists board Flight 139, which departed from Tel Aviv in Israel earlier today. There are 246 passengers on board, many of them Israeli. When the plane reaches cruising altitude, the seatbelt sign goes off. That is the terrorists' agreed signal to strike. Passengers see three men and a woman jump to their feet. They brandish handguns and unpinned grenades. Among the terrified passengers, Israeli diplomat Ilan Hartouf and his 74-year-old mother, Dora Block. They had their fingers itching on the trigger and they wanted to kill us. We were all sure of it. We knew these people wanted to kill. Sarah Davidson is traveling with her husband Uzi and her teenage sons Ron and Benny. I looked at my children's eyes at that moment. That's what I remember. They were, they were both, they have both blue eyes. The blue eyes were looking up there, like if talking to God. Oh God, why it happened to us? A hijacker storms into the cockpit. He orders the pilot to set the plane on a different course and to kill all radio contact. Air traffic control alerts Israel. Flight 139 has been hijacked. A note is delivered to Israel's Prime Minister, Yitzhak Rabin. This is actual archive footage of the moment he receives the news.
Rabin makes sure one man gets word straight away. Deep beneath the Ministry of Defense compound in Tel Aviv is the pit. It's bombproof, windowless, and the thumping heart of the Israeli military. Open every day, 24 7. Muki Betzer gets the news. He's acting head of the counter terrorist squad. The feeling is one of anger and fury. The terrorists are negotiating off the backs of innocents. Betzer's unit has dealt with plane hijackings before. In 1972, 12 of its men dressed as ground crew and stormed a hijacked jet at Lod Airport in Tel Aviv. They killed two terrorists and freed all 100 passengers. Israel's major airport is placed on high alert. In previous incidents, Palestinian terrorists have forced hijacked planes to land in Israel. Betzer is confident that if the aircraft does come back, they have the know-how to launch an assault. All his radar operators can do is watch and wait. On board, the lead terrorist makes an announcement over the PA system. He explains that they are a unit from the PFLP. He speaks with a German accent. The woman is also German. She orders the passengers to surrender their passports and to prepare to be searched. She hurls anti-Semitic abuse. Well, the way she looked at us, the way she talked to us. Passport. What her parent generation didn't do to Jews, she would do. Pass it away. Sarah Davidson's husband, Uzi, is a flight navigator with the Israeli Defense Force. His ID badge is a dead giveaway. He's got to get rid of it before he's searched. It has to be destroyed, so we threw it, both of us. They squeeze the chewed up pieces of badge into a used cola can. Come on, where is it? With seconds to spare. Betzer's radar operators report that Flight 139 is not flying to Israel. It's heading towards Libya in North Africa. In another country, the Israeli military has no jurisdiction. Two and a half hours after it was hijacked, the jet lands at Benghazi airport. Libya is a supporter of the Palestinian cause. The terrorists send a request to President Muammar Gaddafi to refuel. The passengers suffer in sweltering heat for hour after hour. One, Patricia Martel, says she's pregnant and fears losing her baby. The terrorists release her. Finally, after seven hours, the plane, 42 tons of fuel heavy, takes off. Destination unknown. The freed woman is flown home to London. Israel sends an agent to debrief her. The woman confirms that a radical Palestinian faction has hijacked the plane and that two of the four terrorists are German. She picks them out of an intelligence file. The unit identifies them as members of Bader Meinhof, an extreme German terror group. For Betzer, this is chilling news. It means that extremist groups are joining forces to attack Israel. He still doesn't know where they're taking the hostages. Or why. 
Late June, 1976. News breaks the Palestinian terrorists have hijacked a passenger jet. Good evening. An Air France jet was hijacked by Palestinian guerrillas today. On board, some 80 Israelis and 157 other passengers. For those with relatives on the flight, it is a waking nightmare. French-Israeli Robert Maimoni's only son, 19-year-old Jean-Jacques, is amongst the hostages. It was the worst hour of my life. I didn't know what to do. I asked myself, what could I do? But I couldn't get an answer. Three hours after leaving Libya, almost 14 hours into the hijacking, the terrorists force the pilot to land. As day breaks, passengers see dozens of troops gather on the tarmac. At midday, a further nine hours into the ordeal, they're herded to a disused terminal building. A soldier captures the drama on film as the hostages realize they're at Entebbe Airport in Uganda, a small state in East Africa. Entebbe has been chosen carefully by the terrorists. It's 2,000 miles from Tel Aviv, a distance which should keep it safe from Israeli commandos. Uganda is ruled by dictator Idi Amin. Uganda, He's famed for being eccentric and unpredictable. Amin arrives at the airport with Ugandan media in tow. On seeing a potential savior, the hostages break into applause. Oh, we were so happy. We were sure that that's it. It's a finish of the whole story. Because Idi Amin, all of us knew, is a very, very great friend of Israel. What most hostages don't realize is that Amin has changed his allegiances. At one time, he enjoyed close ties with Israel. Then, in 1972, Israeli Premier Golda Meir refused to provide aircraft for Amin to attack neighboring Kenya. Amin responded by pledging his allegiance to the Palestinian cause. Israel is being challenged by terrorists and an entire army. Fortunately, it's an army that acting head of the counter-terrorist unit, Muki Betza, knows well. In an extraordinary coincidence, Betza helped train Ugandan soldiers. He knows their weaknesses. Their knowledge is very basic. They know how to load a gun, fight in an open field, and read the map. Then, an even bigger breakthrough. He finds out that an Israeli construction firm built the old terminal at Entebbe. The firm still holds the blueprints. Betzer devours every detail. Before sending a rescue mission, he must know the building inside out. The front of the building has seven points of entry. Doors three and four lead directly into the main lounge, where the terrorists hold the hostages. Monday night, the passengers are forced to sleep on the floor with the lights left on. 5 p.m., day three. A telegram from the terrorists reveal their demands. They want dozens of jailed terrorists released. Like Japanese extremist Kozo Akamoto, who carried out a massacre at Israel's Lod airport in 72. And Archbishop Capucci, who smuggled weapons to terrorists in the Middle East. They set a deadline of Thursday, 2 p.m. This gives the Israelis 45 hours to respond. If their demands aren't met by then, the terrorists will start shooting hostages. Publicly, military commentators insist that Entebbe is too far away for Israel to launch a rescue. We don't have any military solution 
it has to be solved on the political side first. Relatives know Israel will never negotiate with terrorists. The situation looks hopeless. Hostages watch Ugandan soldiers smash through a partition wall. The German woman inspects the seized passports. She calls out names and directs hostages into the makeshift room. Terence Johnson. The passengers realize that the terrorists are separating the Israeli hostages from the non-Israelis. In the concentration camps, this process was known as selectia, or selection. The Nazis murdered Sarah's aunts and uncles during the Second World War. The feeling was uh, kind of a disaster, like a Holocaust again. I never thought that it will happen again after the World War II, such a separation. The terrorists tell the selected Israelis that come the deadline, they will be singled out for execution. Day four, less than 24 hours to the deadline. Muki Betza is under pressure. His commander is away on exercise and Defense Minister Shimon Perez is pressing for a military option. The unit insists a raid isn't an option yet. It can't send men into an unknown situation. Betzer needs more information about the terrorists' weaponry and tactics. Defense Minister Shimon Perez realizes he must buy more time for Betzer. Perez discovers that Armin wants to use the crisis to boost his standing as a world leader. The Israeli decides to turn this to his advantage. I thought, well, he was the guy that we can play a little bit with. Because they told me many stories about him. They told me that he's looking for world glory. They told him that if he will help us to save the hijacked people, he may get an overprice, which immediately appealed to his old dreams. Day five. Three hours to the deadline. Israel steadfastly maintains its policy of refusing to negotiate with terrorists. For hostages' families, frustration at the politicians boils over. Give the hijackers what they want, they screamed. Just let our loved ones come back alive. Robert Maimoni joins the campaign, urging Israel to give in to the demands. I always hoped that for that price, we could get our son back alive. The terrorists move the Israeli hostages back to the main terminal. Sarah Davidson is forced to confront her worst fears. The worst thing is if they take my children from me. If they will take them, I don't know, I, I, I could kill them with my hands. I would do anything just to save my two children. Something has to give, or innocent people will be murdered. It's minutes until the deadline when Palestinian terrorists will execute Israeli hostages. The world watches, listens, and prays. In Jerusalem and throughout Israel, Jews were saying special prayers for the safety of the hostages. The families of the hostages take matters into their own hands. They descend upon the Tel Aviv office of Premier Yitzhak Rabin and make a demand of their own. Time was running out of the relatives of the Israeli hostages spilled out into an angry outpouring of emotion. For Israel's politicians, the pressure is intolerable. With no military option, they announce a U-turn which stuns the world. It will give in to the terrorists' demands. 
The Israelis are frustrated and resigned. Frustrated because there's nothing they can do to influence the situation except give in to the hijackers and resigned to doing just that. The news comes as a massive relief for the hostages' families. But they, like the rest of the world, are being tricked by the Israeli government. I have the highest respect for the feelings of the parents. But deep in my heart, I didn't have the slightest hesitation that it is either to release them by force or to lose them. Idi Amin believes he's forced the Israelis to back down. In his own mind, he's negotiated a peaceful resolution which will earn him the respect of the world. He persuades the terrorists to extend the deadline to Sunday, 1 p.m., in 72 hours' time. Then, Israel's bluff pays off beyond their wildest dreams. Those pro-Palestinian extremists who hijacked an Air France jet to Uganda released 100 hostages today before a deadline for death expired. In a move that piles even more pressure on Israel, the terrorists release all of the non-Israeli hostages. But for Muki Betzer, it's a breakthrough. He knows the released hostages can provide the precise intelligence he needs. That moment, I was very emotional. I said, wow, they've made a great mistake. The eyewitnesses rack their brains to summon every morsel of crucial intelligence. Betza learns there are at least six terrorists. They work in shifts, with two off-duty in a first-class lounge at any one time. Each carries a machine gun. Some carry explosives. There is another crucial piece of information. Each night, at midnight, the hostages are ordered to lie down on straw mattresses, and by 1 a.m., most sleep. The pressure is on the counter-terrorist unit to come up with a rescue plan. Yoni Netanyahu returns from an exercise to take control. With Betzer and Air Force Squadron leader Josh Shani, they spend hours thrashing out the details of a rescue mission. It's called Operation Thunderbolt. It's one of the boldest, most audacious missions ever attempted. The plan has three critical stages. Each man plays a critical role. Stage one, the journey. They must get a unit of commandos to Entebbe. This is the task of pilot Josh Shani. Shani will lead a convoy of four Hercules C-130 transporter planes on a 2,500 mile route to Uganda. Entebbe Airport consists of two terminals. The hostages are being held at the old terminal to the east. 2.4 kilometers to the west is the new terminal. The plan is for the four Hercules to use the cover of night to land undetected on this runway. Shani must land first. The other three Hercules will touch down seven minutes later with backup and supplies. Shani has been warned that the runway lights will most likely be off. In other words, he must land virtually blind. This maneuver isn't in the handbook. Now can you imagine that if the terrorists will be alert they can start shooting, they can kill everybody in five minutes. Stage two, the transfer. Once the lead Hercules lands, 30 commandos must get to the doors of the terminal in total secrecy. It's a two kilometer journey. Over 100 Ugandan soldiers stand guard on the tarmac, outside the terminal and on the control tower. Muki Betzer comes up with an outrageous idea. They plan to get from the Hercules to the terminal by posing as a Ugandan military escort. 
Betza recalls how Armin and his army chiefs are driven about in large black cars, pursued by military jeeps. Ugandan soldiers live in terror of Armin and his generals. When they see such an escort, they let it pass unchallenged. The Israelis are bringing a black Mercedes and two Jeeps to Entebbe. Incredibly, they plan to drive them straight past the Ugandans all the way to the terminal. Stage three, the assault. Yoni Netanyahu and a small force will take on the Ugandans outside on the tarmac. Meanwhile, teams of three will storm through the terminal doors, eliminate the terrorists, and free the hostages. Saturday breaks at Entebbe. It's the day before the deadline. For hostage Sarah Davidson, it's no longer a question of if she dies, but how. For me, I just wanted it to be with no hearts. I didn't want to be wounded and not to, to get any pains anymore. Just finish my life as it is. She doesn't know that a unit from the Israeli army is on its way. 23 hours to the deadline, an armada of four Hercules C-130 planes takes off from Israel. They are embarking on the 2,500 mile, nine and a half hour flight to Entebbe, Uganda. Operation Thunderbolt is underway. I knew personally that my head is at stake. If it will fail, everybody will agree that I'm responsible. But if the soldier is risking his life, how about the leader? He should also risk his career. So I felt myself like a soldier. The convoy must first make it all the way to Entebbe. It is a journey fraught with danger. The route down the Red Sea takes them within radar range of three countries who in 1976 are enemies of Israel. Egypt, Saudi Arabia and the Sudan. To avoid being picked up on radar, they must fly the entire length of the Red Sea, 900 miles, less than 100 feet above the surface of the water. The task weighs heavily on the 30-year-old shoulders of lead pilot, Josh Sharney. I said, this is it now, this is it. To do it or to, to be written in the history as the greatest failure in Israeli Air Force, an Israeli military operation. At Entebbe, an ambulance removes ailing 74-year-old Dora Block to a hospital in Kampala, 22 miles away. Her son, Ilan, is forced to remain behind. I said I would like to go with her. But then the German woman shouted, No, most certainly not, you idiot, what you and so on. But I was very much worried about my beloved mother. On the lead Hercules, Muki Betzer has volunteered to take on the most dangerous role of the mission. Betzer will lead a team of three through door three into the main room where the hostages are held. To his men, Betzer exudes courage. In truth, he's tormented by a previous failure. Two years earlier, Betzer played a part in a botched rescue mission in Marlot, northern Israel. When Palestinian gunmen took over a school, the Israelis launched an assault. The terrorists saw the Israelis coming and turned their weapons onto the hostages. 21 children were slaughtered. Betzer is desperate to make amends. Right on schedule, minutes before midnight, Shani prepares to touch down. He takes a deep breath. He must land 72 tons of hardware in the dark. As Shani makes his approach, he sees the runway. The lights 
are on. The chief of the Air Force, he asked me the question then, are you okay? Do you see the runway? Can you land? I took all the strings and took a deep breath so my voice will sound calm, not to put him under pressure. I said, yes, sir, everything is under control. Don't worry. That was a great moment. Runway is there. I can do it. The lead Hercules touches down. If the Ugandan soldiers have seen it, the Israelis have lost the crucial element of surprise. It's 12.02 a.m. The Israelis know that by now, 2.4 kilometers away in the terminal, the hostages will be settling down to sleep. This is key to the plan. Only the terrorists remain upright, at optimum height for a headshot. There's been no reaction to the Hercules. Phase two, getting the men to the terminal is already underway. Then the Mercedes drove under my left wing. Very exciting moment, very exciting moment. No, now it's really happening. Deputy Commander Muki Betzer rides in the Mercedes with eight other commandos. You could smell the rain. It's a very nice smell. And it was a smell that reminded me of my time in Uganda before. My senses were heightened. Adrenaline is flowing through your body. You feel sharp. The Israeli soldiers can see the terminal clearly. On the control tower, Ugandan soldiers are oblivious to the threat. Betzer keeps repeating one mantra. If they make it to the terminal in secret, they will win the day. Then, Giora Zuzman spots something. Suddenly we saw two Uganda uh, soldiers, and one of them just shake with his gun and aim to hurt us. Betzer knows from his days in Uganda that this gesture is standard military practice. On seeing an escort, a soldier raises his gun and shouts, advance. Betzer tells his colleagues to ignore the Ugandan soldier and to focus on the terminal. I can see the route in front of me. I understand, this is it, that we have already succeeded in our mission. In less than 30 seconds, we are already through the doors. But Yoni Netanyahu is unit commander. He overrules Betzer and orders Giora to help him eliminate the soldier. Okay, you have to kill them. They're trying to interrupt us. And let's do it and let's continue what we have to do. Yoni and myself, we have a, a pistols with silencer. Ugandan takes several hits. The Israelis believe they've eliminated the threat. Then, an Israeli in the jeep spots the Ugandan getting to his feet. They fail to kill him. The Israeli aims his Kalashnikov. The machine gun doesn't come with a silencer. The sound reverberates throughout the airport. They've lost the element of surprise. The plan is in tatters. Ugandan soldiers spray machine guns at the vehicles forcing them to stop 70 meters short of the terminal. Betzer fears hostages are being slaughtered inside. 
This is situation critical. Hostages take cover any way they can. One of them, Ilan Hartuv, comes face to face with a terrorist gun. Betza makes it to the control tower. He sees that his assigned entrance is blocked up. The tragedy of Marlot came back to me, and the word Marlot, Marlot, Marlot beat inside my head. I felt it was going to happen again. Betzer knows it's up to him to get the plan back on track. With rounds ricocheting about them, he and his men make a dash for door four. Inside, Ilan Hartuv stares down the barrel of a terrorist gun. I was sure he was going to shoot at us. He had his finger on the trigger. A bullet sends the hostages diving. It's come from Betzer's breaking team. Who's shooting all over? Inside, outside, grenades, bombs, smells, shouting, shooting, hell. For a second, silence. He knows more terrorists lurk in this room. Giora Zuzman leads his breaking team through door five towards a first-class lounge where off-duty terrorists rest. They encounter three Ugandan soldiers. Then they come face to face with two unarmed men in civilian clothing. They must make a split-second decision. Are they terrorists or innocent hostages? And I told him, uh, shoot at them. They are terrorists. So no, they are hostages. I said, no, you are wrong. Uh, shoot them. Zussman sees one of the men reach for his belt. He knows some of the terrorists carry explosives. On the tarmac, Yoni Netanyahu and his men are struggling to gain the upper hand. Back in the main terminal, Betzer and his breaking team seek out the remaining terrorists. You are even more sharp, and your eyes are scanning every part of the room. And from your elbow to your finger, you are ready to shoot, and you know that the first bullet must hit him before he shoots and kills you. a moment of quiet. And somebody says in Hebrew, listen, there are some Israeli soldiers here. And I put up a little bit my head, and I saw in front of me standing a soldier. He was standing there with a gun, looking at us, and saying, listen, guys, we came to take you home.
the smoke clears in the corridor leading to the VIP room. The last two terrorists are dead. The bullets that killed them only partially detonated their explosives. Zussman and his colleague are uninjured. The Israelis have killed all six terrorists and secured the terminal. But their mission is far from complete. The Ugandans still control the apron. An Israeli goes down. It's the commander, Yoni Netanyahu. The Israelis are outnumbered and overwhelmed. The rescue is in crisis. Operation Thunderbolt is seven minutes old. The Israelis are being outgunned by Ugandan soldiers. Muki Betzer steps up to take charge as the commander, Yoni Netanyahu, is down. The other three Hercules land with 200 soldiers. Betzer orders an all-out assault. I ordered the men to come and attack them with rockets, RPGs, small arms, automatic rifles, with everything we had. The Israelis crush the resistance. Twenty Ugandan soldiers lie dead. Inside the terminal, soldiers ready the hostages to leave. But one man faces a horrendous dilemma. Ilan Hartuv knows if he leaves, it'll mean abandoning his elderly mother, who's 22 miles away, in a hospital in Kampala. I knew I had to leave, <laughs> that I would be killed. Uh, no use sacrificing myself. Uh, I couldn't help my mother. I only hoped they would find a way to, to save her, to do some trading with the Idi Amin and to save her. 59 minutes after pilot Josh Sharni landed the first Hercules, the convoy takes off with the freed hostages. It was one of the greatest moments of my life because you know we did it. The hostages are free. They're flying home. News of the rescue breaks while the planes are still flying back to Israel. This is Israel broadcasting from Jerusalem. Here is a special news broadcast. All the hostages held for more than a week by Arab terrorists in Entebbe, Uganda, have been rescued and are being flown home by the Israel army. As the planes refuel in Nairobi, the troops learn that Yoni Netanyahu, their inspirational leader, is dead. It was very hard to take. We were close friends. I lost not only a commander, but a close friend. It was on the very rare occasions in my life that I had some tears in my eyes. Cameras capture the euphoric scenes at Ben Gurion Airport, Tel Aviv. Israel has triumphed against all odds. Robert Maimoni struggles to track down his only son, Jean-Jacques. An official directs him to an office. And when we got into the office, they told us simply that our son was dead. I went crazy and I was hurling myself at the officials to ask them why, 
Why did you hide the truth from us? Why didn't you tell us the truth from the start? Although they knew that he was dead, before they transported him, he was already dead. Jean-Jacques Maimoni was shot dead at Entebbe. Betzer and his men mistook him for a terrorist. Here occurred a tragic situation where in his enthusiasm that the army had arrived, he jumped in happiness, but it was a horrible accident. I must add that up until today, the pain that we have had myself and my wife and my five daughters has shadowed us with great sadness for 30 years. Dora Block, the 74-year-old removed to a hospital in Kampala when she fell ill, is never heard from again. Years later, members of her family travel to Uganda to find out what happened. As soon as Idi Amin heard that uh, she was left after we were saved, he commanded his murder gangs and took her out uh, of the hospital and and killed her, and of course, we, we later knew where her body was dumped. So after Amin was toppled, we could get back her body to, to Israel to be buried near my late father. Five Israelis died, but 101 were rescued at Entebbe. It is celebrated as a defining moment in Israel's short history. In the space of 59 minutes, one small nation showed the world that terrorism can be defeated. <laughs>